Hello everyone, Chad Franzen here, and welcome to the Kingdom Finance Show. Today we are going to reveal what you really need to know about the economy, the stock market, and real estate. And we're going to give you action steps to take right now to become a Kingdom Impact Investor. It's time to bring clarity out of chaos. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Chad Franzen here with the Kingdom Finance Show. And on behalf of Wealth Builders Investments, I want to welcome you to our program today. I've got some very special guests I'm going to introduce here in a minute. And um, but before we do that, I want to give you just a little bit of background um, on previous episodes of the podcast. What we've been talking about is the different types of investments, the different types of asset classes that we recommend investing in. Now, of course, this show, purely educational purposes, we're not giving you investment advice, but I do want to give you some of my personal opinions and educate you on what's out there. So on past shows, you may want to go back and watch those. We've talked about our, our kingdom model, our investment model, where how we invest in the stock market, how we invest in fixed income, and how we invest in real estate. Well, on today's show, um, I want to talk about a unique asset class. And in the teaching I do, if you've heard it, I often call this a non-correlated asset. And a lot of people will come to me and say, hey, what the heck is that? I don't understand what that means. I'm a common person. Um, but a non-correlated asset is just something that you put in your portfolio that helps to diversify you beyond the way normal stocks and bonds work. And so um, a lot of times higher net worth families and you know organizations, when they have more dollars to invest, they'll start diversifying into what I call bespoke investments or non-correlated investments. So I thought, well, it seems a little nebulous when I teach on that. So I thought, why don't I bring on uh, my good friends from Wildlife Partners, Chris and Brian Gilroy, and um I'll let you decide um, who's the older brother and who's the younger brother when we bring them on. Um, but I want to give you a real behind the scenes look at, well, what's a private investment? What's a non-correlated investment that could help me, potentially help me in my portfolio when we start talking about suitability, long-term results? Now, again, I'm not giving you advice here. I just want to educate you on what's out there in the market. So for today's show, we're just going to talk about an example of non-correlated assets and I think you're going to find this really fascinating. So let me introduce uh, our distinguished guest. We have uh, Brian Gilroy, who's a co-founder of Wildlife Partners. And, and Brian, I refer to you as the creative genius behind the business. And uh, welcome to today's show. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. I think that name's probably a little overly kind, but uh, I'll take it. So, so should we should we introduce your brother as well, or or what do, what do you think? Are you talking about my younger brother? <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, so younger brother Chris Gilroy, uh, he's the uh, operations executive or the brains behind the show, and uh, they are uh, again Chris and Brian are both co-founders of Wildlife Partners, based in uh, San Antonio, Texas, or more specifically Bernie, Texas. If you're familiar with with Texas and so I'm really excited. Thank you for your time. Um, you know, I many of the folks that watch us on the show know that I grew up in East Texas and I grew up coming down to the Hill Country, Kerrville, um, Bernie, other places where my uncle ran ranches for private landowners back in the back in the 80s, 80s and 90s. And it was always fascinating to me to see the different whitetails and the different animals they had on the ranches. And then I remember some of these ranches would have exotic uh, species, exotic wildlife, different types. And um, and so when I met Chris a few years ago and I started learning about the business model that you all have created at Wildlife Partners, it, it really clicked with me having grown up in Texas and grown up coming down to the hill country that, hey, this makes a lot of sense of how you do that. So what I thought we'd do is start with you, Brian, and, and maybe just give our listeners kind of an overview of the genesis of how Wildlife Partners started and your background and how you guys got started in uh, wildlife ranching and conservation. Sure. Happy happy to do that. And th thanks for having us on. It's a pleasure to be able to share a little bit about both our, our company and the industry overall. We're pretty passionate about what we do and being able to do this with my brother has just really been quite a privilege to say the least. So 
Um, you know, you were talking about non-correlated assets and and um, your description of these things, and I, I think maybe the term exotic might apply. Um, you know, this this is um, an out of the box investment. It's something that the general public would not typically be aware of. It just so happened, geographically speaking, I was in the area where this is pretty significant, and so that that's really what lent itself to me getting started in this. So my background uh, is actually that I'm a terrible student. I was not very good at school. Um, I really enjoyed making money and uh, enjoyed working. And so <clears throat> I jumped into the career that I started in my early 20s, which was in the oil and gas business. And it, it was kind of blended with the financial services industry. I was a stockbroker, but I didn't sell stocks in the oil and gas industry, or I didn't sell typical stocks. I was focused on the oil and gas sector. So I, I did that for, oh, I don't know, 15 or 16 years, something like that. And like everybody else, when oil was $140 a barrel, I started looking for things that I could do that would offset my tax bill. Um, I'm not a big fan of paying tax. In fact, I, I don't like it at all. And so I met with my tax advisor at the time. And he recommended that we get involved in one of two things. It was either a captive insurance company or livestock. And I, I didn't really understand the captive insurance thing. I, I ultimately discovered I didn't have enough insurable risk to, to make the captive work. But I did live in Texas, and there's lots of livestock here. But unbeknownst to me, African hoof stock are treated as livestock. Uh, in the tax code, their their business assets, and so they qualify for depreciation. And at the time, depreciation was only fifty percent in the first year, and it, I think it was capped at a million dollars, something like that. But the long and the short of it is, is that I, I started buying animals um, for the purpose of offsetting my tax bill. And the other side benefit to this is that I enjoy it. You know, I, I enjoy. Being in the outdoors, I enjoy wildlife. I enjoy the idea of, of conservation. My kids enjoyed it. Um, and so it was kind of an excuse for me to not go to work and, and instead go to the ranch yeah. because I had this quote unquote tax write off slash business um, that I really enjoyed. Chris and I started working together while I was in the oil and gas business. That that started as the result of a golf tournament. We we played in a golf tournament every year, and um, one day on the golf course, the subject came up about maybe opening an office in Dallas. So Chris and I started working together in the oil and gas industry. I don't know how many years it's been. It's probably, if I'm just guessing off the top of my head, it's been 15 years or somewhere close to that. Anyways. I never intended to start Wildlife Partners. I never intended to offer an investment product to the, you know, to the investing world. I, I was just doing this for fun and for tax write-offs. And then as I got into it, um, I discovered that it was far more lucrative than I ever imagined it could be. But the only real model that existed was the commercial hunting ranch which I didn't have any interest in. I, I didn't want to be in a position where that was how I was going to make my living. And so as I navigated this path, I would say as the result of a prayer and a lot of good fortune and some grace, um, I had a, a lot of success with doing this between 2011 and 2015, just individually. And someone approached us in early 2016, and it was, interestingly enough, it was one of my investors in the oil and gas industry, and he inquired about getting involved in the wildlife business with us. And so that was kind of the, the beginning. You know, I spent um, several million dollars of my own money doing this between 2011 and 2015, skinning my knees up, making mistakes, studying the industry learning what the flaws were with the marketplace. And out of that individual experience of both gain and loss, I identified that there was some pretty massive opportunities available for people if we were to make an effort to scale our, our business by allowing other people to get involved. And so that's what we started in 2016. Um, Chris and I created a product and 
we got on an airplane and we flew around America for a week to see if anybody would buy into our our uh, our story about Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox. And that, that's Chris and I's story. You know, when we first got started, we're traveling to places like Colorado and Oklahoma and Arkansas and Missouri, where people don't know anything about the exotic industry in Texas. And we're showing up telling them not only are there African yeah. animals all over Texas, but that you can invest in them. And so we always yeah. equated that that trip or that story to, you know, we're telling people about Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox. The only difference yeah. is, is that this, this is real. Yeah. <laughs> and it, and it, it's actually true. So, you know, we we took this trip and ultimately what ended up happening is that we we came home with a commitment for a million dollars from one person. And about three weeks later, we had raised five million dollars. And wow. so Good. between between 2016 and today, um, our our revenues from the sale of animals just recently surpassed two hundred million dollars. And so what started out is it is incredible. It's really remarkable. Yeah. Honestly, it's, yeah. it's something Chris and I, uh, I, you know, we, we have to pause frequently and just take a deep breath and go, how in the world did this happen? And I, I think we both recognize that I, I feel like we were put on this path to go do this versus coming up with some genius idea on our own and making it happen. It's well, we've had some, some difficult challenges along the way in building a business that's unique the truth is, is that this has been pretty easy. Um, things have just fallen in place. The marketplace has worked really well for us. The overall industry has just responded in an unbelievable manner. And there's just so much excitement and there's so much enthusiasm around the model that Chris and I created. And there's thousands of landowners that have adopted the strategies that we created um, that came out of this experimentation process between 2011 and 2015. And today, leaving aside the people that we deal with all over the United States, the most sophisticated, intelligent, wealthy uh, landowners in Texas have implemented this as a strategy for both saving taxes, um, an impact investment that's doing great things for wildlife, but also as a cash flow stream for their for their private ranches, which initially were vacation properties, but now they're cash right. flowing businesses. So yeah. that, that's kind of the the short version of the story. It's it's um there's a lot more detail when you get down into the weeds, but you know, the bottom line is is that Chris and I were very fortunate to fall into a, a second career, both of us in our 40s. And our, my kids are involved and Chris's wife is involved and it's it's really turned into a fairy tale to be honest with you. That's great. So when you started it in in 2011 just personally, you know, just kind of a you know of what you shared, what what were some of the first animals that you purchased back when that all began for you for you, you know the personally? very first the very first animal that I bought were hybrid ibex which is probably okay. the lowest of the low that you can buy. It's basically a barnyard goat. <laughs> um, but I, I didn't know any better. And and there's this yeah. clan of clan of brokers that existed back then. They only had one interest, and that was unloading whatever was on their trailer that day. And yeah. I, I happened to be the willing sucker that was there waiting to buy it because it was tax deductible. Right. So I, I I I bought Persian Persian ibex, you know, and here's a funny story about that. So at the time the property I was on, I was leasing it, and I I thought the the fence was secure, but I I hadn't really covered the whole perimeter. There was one part of the ranch that had a huge cliff on it, and uh -huh. cows would never go over this cliff, but ibex like them. So I bought these ibex. And a couple of weeks later, I'm driving down the highway and I'm passing the the, the ranch. I'm outside on, on the highway there. And there's this huge cliff. And I look up on the cliff and there are my Ibex. They're no longer in the fence. They're up on this cliff wandering around. And so that that's kind of how green, it gives you an example of how green I was and how little I yeah. knew about what I was doing. We've, we've since fixed the fence. And, Get your brother um, to build the fence. Did you just put yeah, your, no. your younger brother to work, let him do the fence. Yeah. No, I, I think in his old age, he's not he's not out there qualified to build fences. 
<laughs> yeah, but, well, now, but uh, tell- no, I went from Persian Ibex to Gimsbach and Sable and Eland, and honestly, I, I bought everything that I was offered um, yeah. because I liked yeah. all of them. I just thought they were cool, and I liked looking at them, and they they were they were a lot more enjoyable to look at than the four walls of the office of the oil company. So. Um, yeah. every time I had a delivery, I needed to be there in person to accept it. So mm-hmm. <laughs> I bought them all. That's great. Well, now I know there's a lot of different species of exotic animals that you all work with, um, as far as buying and selling brokering with, with, with land over landowners. Um, Chris, we'll have you jump in, uh, maybe share a little bit and then Brian, feel free to, to add on what, what Chris leaves out. Right. So, yeah. um, there's quite a few species that you all work with. What are some of the types of animals just for people to to understand? I know there's probably 16 or more that are endangered. So it's definitely a, a good conservation story, but it's a great business model. What are some of the species that you all work with a lot, Chris? I think in total, we work with a little over 50 species. I'd say probably 35 or 40 of those species are what I call active, where we're putting those in nearly every fund that we're putting together at one level or another. Um, most of them are going to be antelope species. Um, most are going to be from Africa. We do have some sheep and goat species. You've got some zebras that we breed as well, so some equine. But generally speaking, probably at least 75% of what we're dealing with comes from Africa, with the rest coming from Asia. Now, some of the specific ones that are more endangered, uh, we've got some great examples there. The Kenyan mountain bongo, which is from a very specific area of Kenya, um, this is critically endangered. There's less than a hundred to believe to be in the wild. I think on our facilities, we probably have close to 30 of them right now. So just in our, our ranches, we've got a third of what is actually in the wild. And that number may actually be even lower. Um, so there's stuff like the Grevy zebra that are from Kenya and Ethiopia. There's 3000 of those globally. And I, I forget what the total number we've got is probably another 30 of those as well. Sorry, on the bongo, it's actually closer to a hundred. Uh, but on the Grevy zebras, there's about 30 of those on our ranches. The whole population of those, close coast to coast, all around the world, is about 3,000 with 2,000 of those left in Africa. Critically endangered. Uh, thankfully, the population on those is stable now. But others are going to be Dama gazelles, Attics, Scimitar horned oryx, stuff that all went extinct essentially in northern Africa many, many years ago that's thriving in Texas today. Just a few examples. Yeah. And share one of the stats that I was amazed by. I knew it was a big industry having grown up in Texas. I mean, oil and gas, ranching, agriculture. I mean, those are just big drivers of the of the economy. But uh, the study that was done, I think, by was it Texas A and M on the economic impact in South Texas. Just just so we capture that. I mean, that was an economic impact study from a handful of years ago. It, it, but what what's the dollar value on that? Yeah, it, was 2000, it was 2007. I'm sorry, 2007. Yes. Okay. First study was done by AM through their agribusiness college. The industry had gotten so big. Somebody needed to do something to kind of get an idea of what was really going on because it's been here since the 30s. So that first study came out. And at the time, after they had done all their surveys, they had said that just the hunting and breeding aspects of the business with no other ancillary things for just exotics had an economic value in Texas or an economic impact annually in Texas alone of over a billion dollars. I believe they said it was $1.3 billion at the time. So you fast forward 10 years, you had an organization go out and look at that study again, try to estimate all of the growth that happened over the last 10 years. Plus they included all aspects of the industry. And they estimated at that point in time, the industry now had an annual, an annual impact just in the state of Texas of over $3 billion a year. I don't have a number for that now. Brian may have a better number for it now. I believe we've far exceeded that by now because that update was in 2016 and this industry has grown dynamically since then. Yeah. Yeah, I would say, and honestly, this is something that that is is gonna happen again here in the near future. There, There will be another impact study done um, just simply because the industry has grown to be so big, government agencies are going to want to know what's going on with our industry just because it, it is affecting so many different things. I, I, I would 
I would not hesitate to say that the ep- economic impact is north of 10 billion at this point. When you factor in the feed companies and the buggies and the, you know, the machinery and the fencing and the staff and all, I mean, it, it's it's pretty monumental what's happened over the last five years. I mean, you have people buying multi-million dollar ranches just to get into this business. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's 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 substantial what's been going on in this state for the last day for the last ten. Mm-hmm. No, it really is, and I think people that aren't familiar with that, if they're not from Texas or don't have a, um, even if you have a ranching background in other states, you may not recognize this. Um, so let just to clarify, so you know, we three of us, we're you know, we like the outdoors, we like hunting and fishing, we're we're big first Second Amendment rights kind of people which a lot of our listeners are as well. Uh, but just to clarify, like the the customers you're working with are, are landowners, ranch owners, right? There's several hundred of them. And so one of the questions I get from people is, well, why does someone, I know you mentioned the tax benefits, which we don't have to get into, but we know there are tax benefits, but uh, a landowner, uh, he's got significant amount of money. He has a ranch in South Texas. Um, he's coming to to buy at your auctions or or buy from you directly um, different types of exotic species. Why does someone like that do that? Just just so listeners understand uh, that mindset for that type of person. Yeah, so I'll I'll take that. So <clears throat> long before we ever offered a product to the investment community, the business that I created. Um, before Wildlife Partners was solely focused on Texas landowners. It, it was not focused on anything else. And what there was a misconception, and the misconception was is that the industry was driven by the hunting world, that people shooting animals was the primary reason why this industry existed. And what I, what I discovered was that that was actually not the truth at all, that the majority of the people that were buying these animals that were participating in the industry were just, they were business people, they were wealthy, they had private ranches, and they bought these animals because they thought they were cool. They weren't even writing them off from a tax standpoint, and they really were not even generating any meaningful revenue out of the ranches. They were doing it simply because they loved it. That no, no other reason other than they loved looking at the animals. There is a secondary reason I guess I should mention, and it's it's bragging rights. You know, there is there is something about owning something that other people don't own. And human beings have always been fascinated with having possession of animals. And so if you go back, you know, thousands of years, people have been in control of lions and tigers and bears and all sorts of exotic animals. And it was reserved for the elite, if you will. So that fascination hasn't gone away even today. So people were buying these animals because there's bragging rights associated with owning cool stuff. And because looking at them is awesome. When, when I entered the market, what I realized is that if I would go out and communicate to landowners that there were these financial incentives to doing this, that they would probably do it in a more meaningful manner. And so that's really what my business started as, is that I would go out and market to a landowner who has a vacation property. A ranch is not deductible. It it doesn't provide tax incentives. If you're If you're raising cows, okay, maybe you're getting a little bit of tax incentive, but not really. The IRS is kind of onto that gig, the gentleman farmer, if you will. And if you're if you're kind of pretending like you're selling a hunt to one of your customers, maybe you get a little tax write-off, but it's not meaningful. It's just this is a vacation property, has no income. Well, if if you'll go out and you'll convert your ranch into a breeding facility, and what what that involves is owning a male and a female. There's no paperwork. There's no official document. There's no designation. It's just if you own males and females animals, you're now a breeder. You're in the breeding business. And as the result of that, the animals themselves qualify for depreciation. But so does the buggy that you're using to go look at them. So does the feeder that you're using to feed them. So does the employee that you have that works on the ranch. 
So is the fencing for the whole ranch. So is the pond that you're going to build to make sure the animals have water, but it also looks really nice. So all these expenses that you were previously incurring just to own the ranch, they're suddenly now tax deductible because you have a business. But the thing that we offered that no one else really offered is that we would come in and buy all of those animals that they had alive. So as their animals breed and reproduce and they end up with a surplus, I would come in and buy all of their animals and I wouldn't have to kill them in order for them to get revenue. And they didn't have to be great gigantic trophies to get revenue. I would buy an animal that was a year old or two years old or three years old. And so suddenly once a year, they have this massive influx of revenue into the ranch. And that revenue paid them back for all of the expenses associated with raising them, and it made a profit. So they get to deduct the animals and deduct all the expenses of the ranch that they were already incurring, and then they create this revenue stream, but the revenue stream is treated as capital gains rather than active income. So it's 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 a vehicle where you take an asset that was previously non-deductible, you convert that into a deductible asset, you buy cool stuff that all your friends make you, you know, they think you're awesome because you have it. You're doing great things for wildlife conservation because you're saving critically endangered rare species. But then on top of that, not only are you getting cash flow, but the cash flow you're getting is tax favored because it's capital gain rather than active income. So instead of yeah. paying 37 and a half percent tax, you're only paying 15. Mm -hmm. So as we educated Texas landowners about this, we just got bombarded. And so the, the next step of doing this was for us to realize if the personality that we're dealing with in Texas, and here's the personality, the personality is they're very conservative in nature. They're pro private property. They love wildlife. Not all, but many of them are hunters. Bottom line is they like the outdoors these are these are traditional conservative. Yeah. Uh, if I go political, they're Republican people, yeah. and 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 they they just love every element of this. Well, Texas is not the only place that that personality exists. Mm -hmm. That that personality exists all over the United States, and so the way we scaled our business was by opening this industry up to the same personality that's been doing this in Texas for all these years by allowing others outside of the state to have access to our land. And right. so our, our customer, whether it's a Texas landowner or whether it's somebody in Idaho, they're the same. It's the same personality. The only difference is one of them owns land in Texas and the other one doesn't. There's no difference between these 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 customers for for our perspective. For you, yeah, and and yeah, and so the the reasons that people do this is that it's fun, it feels good, it it provides additional tax incentives above and beyond just buying the animals, and it's it's tax favored cash flow. Right. Yeah, that's a good summary. And then um I want to I want to wrap up with a couple of questions. I want to um Chris, I want to have you kind of share one of the things I, I think Brian from what you shared is it it helps people understand as investors or potential investors that we work with that you you're getting access to something to participate in that you wouldn't otherwise have access to, right? Unless you are a landowner. If you go buy you're going to go buy a 2 3 5 10 million dollar ranch and do this. So Again, it's just like any other investment, except this one, um, you know, it's definitely, I think you can get a little more up close and personal with it. Um, Chris, speak a little bit to, um, I know you all do some auctions and events for investors and partners um, there at the ranches. Maybe share a little bit about just wildlife partners, kind of what you all do corporately and what that looks like. Sure, you know, it's probably actually my favorite thing about what we do is when Brian and I started this, and by the way, I have to give him full credit. I had none of this idea. When he looked at me originally with the idea in his brain, I thought he had gas. So it was a very 
It was all his so ideas. So you, you didn't immediately say you're a creative genius. No, brother. I did not. But no, so. you did. Okay. <laughs> you probably can't even say on this podcast what you told him, I would imagine. So um it was it was interesting. But he said, Trust me, I'm gonna send you something. And here we are eight <laughs> years later, and like he said, two hundred million dollars <laughs> in sales later. So I think it went okay. Um and now I've lost my train of thought on where you went with that. But um well, one of the one of the things you most enjoy about yeah, the, the partners people. and it's 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 people, the yeah. people. It's people get involved. Like we just had this event this last weekend. It was our fall auction. You know, we have two auctions um, a year, fall and spring, or spring and fall. <laughs> and there was four hundred people there. And I think the total count on the partners was probably sixty or so. These are people that come. They bring their wives. They sometimes they bring kids. They make a weekend out of it. They hang out with us. Uh, people come and visit the ranches. We have, you know, lodging at all the facilities. Um, it's it's truly an investment that people can get involved with. And Brian and I have heard this from the beginning. It, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this where we have someone say, this is the only investment I've ever made that my wife loves. Yeah. Because it's not a building. It's not an oil well. It's not something they don't understand. It's a giraffe. It's you know, it's uh, kudu and sable and it's animals that they get to see pictures of. And if they really want to come down and spend the time, they can go to the ranch, they can go to auctions, conventions that we're at. So sure. it's it's something that people can definitely be involved in that I just, I don't, I, I invest in stuff personally. You invest, Brian invests, but I don't have things that I've invested in that I can go be a part of outside of a restaurant that I invested in that just loses money. So um yeah. The, the, it's it's just unique in that way, and it is unique in that um, this is it's we're the only company doing this. You you can't live in Colorado or Utah or anywhere outside of the state of Texas and you don't own land and invest in animals unless you're doing it with us. So it, it's yeah. a very exclusive thing. It's fairly limited in size compared to the investment world, and it, it is something that people really love being a part of. Yeah, it, it checks you know, a lot what, of boxes. What, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Brian. One, one thing I, I wanted to add that will probably help, you know, listeners to to really better understand this in terms that may fit into the world that, that they're in versus this exotic world that we're in. You know, at the end of the year, um, people go through this process of looking for assets to buy in order to reduce their tax liability. If if you've got a business, you're looking for a truck to buy, or you're looking for a, a tractor to buy, or you're looking for farm equipment or whatever. You start looking for these assets to buy so that you can reduce your tax bill, right? Well, those assets that you're buying, number one, they're depreciating assets. And number two, they they just sit there. They don't make any money for you unless you have an operator. You have to pay someone to get on that machine and go work in order to be able to make that asset generate any kind of income. So you're buying an asset that depreciates and it, it doesn't actually earn income. But if you hire someone to work on it and it does generate income, the, inner, the income it generates is active income. So you're paying 37.5% tax if you're in the top tax bracket. The flip side to that is, is that when you buy a sable or a kudu or an eland or a gimsbok or a giraffe or an inyala, any of these animals, it's treated exactly the same under the tax code as a tractor or as a Chevy truck. It's the same asset class. But the difference is, is that the sable, the kudu, the inyala, the bongo, they have historically appreciated an asset or in value versus depreciated. So the asset you're buying, it's actually going up in value with use versus going down in value with use. And the flip side is you don't have to have an operator out there riding it in order to get it to produce the income. All you need is a male. The male yeah. will chase the female around. You don't even have to play him a love song. You don't have to get perfume. Yeah. You don't have to... You have to do a dance for them. The moon doesn't have to be right. The male just does his work. And what the female produces is an offspring that if you hold it for a period of one year and then you sell it, it's taxed at capital gains rates. So yeah. at the end of the year, you see these people scrambling around to go buy assets that go down in value that don't generate income. And if it did, it's it's enormously taxed income. 
Whereas if you right. buy exotic wildlife, it goes up in value. It has a baby without an operator, and the and the income that it creates is is tax is tax favored. And so, yeah. you know, as Chris talks about why there's 400 people at our auction, why there's 200 people online, why do people from all over America come here to get involved to see what we're doing? It, it, it is because it's fun, and it is because it's unique. But at the end of the day, it's because it works. It makes yeah. sense financially. So no, I hope that maybe puts it into perspective and gives a little bit better idea because as an asset, it's exactly the same as business equipment. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same. It's identical. It just doesn't function exactly the same way. Yeah. I mean, that's the that's a great way to summarize our, mm -hmm. our time today. I mean, that is the definition of <laughs> passive income, right? I mean, that's you know, what you're talking about is, you know, it's, it's like rental income, ex except in a completely different, different industry. Um, one of the things Chris and I, uh, Chris, you and I have talked about, um, I'm going to say this on the show. So we got to follow through on is for, for our clients who are active investment partners with wildlife partners, uh, we're going to do, um, a few days next spring, uh, down at the ranch and, uh, Chris will, uh, put on his chef hat and I don't know if that's good or bad, Brian, but I know I know your dad's a good cook. But um, and uh, we're going to take a group of clients down there that are current investors in wildlife partners, because I think for me, at least, um, that was really that's what solidifies all this. I hope this this episode has been helpful to, to kind of understand. Again, we're talking about non-correlated bespoke investments. How do you diversify all those fancy terms? But to go and see it, I think to really have boots on the ground. Uh, so we're going to do that in the spring. We'll coordinate some dates, uh, Chris, with you. And um, again, for those interested, just reach out to me. Again, you will need to be a current investor in Wildlife Partners, but we've got quite a few that that love it. They love they love all the features you've mentioned. And anytime we do a review with clients, um, they they most want to talk about Wildlife Partners. You know, they they don't so much care about the other things because it's kind of like chocolate and vanilla ice cream um, for that, but you know, just to wrap this up, uh, my son, Tyler, is really uh, into wildlife conservation and he loves endangered animals. And so when I showed him this a few years ago and we came down to Mountain Home Ranch with you, Chris, and I mean, that really resonated even with him as a 11, 12 year old at the time of, oh, I understand how this business works and why it's a good thing for animal conservation, but it's also a good a good business move. So, Chris, um, any thoughts you want to share you as we wrap up here? Wrap up here. I got a, I got a really bad echo there. What was that? Um, just wrapping up. Was there anything else you wanted to share on the topic of, of what you guys are doing at Wildlife Partners? Or, I mean, just as an as overall thing, you know, the, the funds that we manage. I mean, people love being a part of this stuff, but it it is something that's got some pretty big advantages to it, both on the upfront tax side of things, as well as, you know, through trials and tribulations over the last eight years, we've actually proven that the wheel does indeed roll. And that's been borne out in the results that we've produced. So it's, it's a, it's a unique thing in the world where you can actually do something good for the world that also comes with financial incentives for you above and beyond just your tax deductions. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a great thing to be a part of and who in the world wouldn't want to own giraffe or kudu or, or sable. Um, it's just, yeah. it's, I'm just, I'm, I'm very, I'm blessed and feel fortunate to be a part of it. Um, like Brian said earlier, being able to do this as brothers, as a family thing, having my wife involved, having, we had, we had our, our mom and our dad and a stepdad at the auction this weekend. So it was great. It was, yeah. and we had an aunt and uncle there. We had cousins and we had everything. So it's, it's really awesome to have that and be a part of it. And I appreciate you being a part of it and the people that you brought that we've met because so far they've all been pretty good people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's always exceptions to the rule, but <laughs> um, well, thanks for letting us profile wildlife partners, Chris and Brian Gilroy. Again, just a great example of small business owners, conservative values that, you know, really doing good work in this field uh, of wildlife uh, ranching and exotic breeding and, um, Again, I'm excited, you know, for the next few years, I think it's going to continue to see uh, more people coming into this market. And um, 
If you want to learn more about this uh, as a part of your investment strategy, again, please reach out to me directly. Again, today was really an educational profile on Wildlife Partners, really pulling back the curtain to show you some of the people I work with on a week-to-week basis, invest with, spend time with, just so you know how we uh, like to manage our resources. So guys, thanks for being here, Brian. Thank you for for uh, birthing this creative idea and dragging your your brother along to do it. And we're really excited to to be a part of it with you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll sign off uh, for today's uh, Kingdom Finance podcast. Again, uh, please subscribe and like the show. Pass it along to your friends and family. If you want to connect with me, you can connect with me online, uh, wealthbuilders.net. And uh, be happy to talk with you more on this topic. Again, we're covering uh, a very unique asset class in the wildlife uh, conservation and breeding industry in South Texas. So, uh, Gilroy Brothers, thank you so much. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Kingdom Finance Show. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review. It really helps to get the word out. For more resources on becoming a Kingdom Investor, And to connect with us directly, visit our website at wealthbuilders.net. That's wealthbuilders.net. We'll see you next time on the Kingdom Finance Show. The content provided is for educational purposes only. We encourage you to seek personalized investment advice from your financial professional. For all tax and legal advice, please consult your CPA or attorney. Investment advisory services are offered through Authentic Counsel, a registered investment advisor. Securities are offered through Cabin Securities, a registered broker-dealer. The content of this podcast does not constitute an offer of securities. Offerings can only be made through an offering memorandum, and you should carefully examine risk factors and other information contained in the memorandum.